Hey everybody, welcome to the law panel, the funnest one of all of them, I'm sure. Uh, my name is Joyce Lai, um, I'm the co-founder of the Fordham Law Regulatory Symposium and also um, Senior Legal Counsel here at Consensus Mesh. So I want to welcome the three panelists here. We have a very diverse group of people. Um, we have a law professor, a law firm partner, and also in-house legal counsel. So I think we're going to cover a lot of ground, but very, very quickly today. Uh, we have three main areas to cover today, um, IP rights, data storage, and also royalties. And if we have enough time and are really quick about it, we'll also touch on securities law as well. Um, so let's get started right away. Um, so in terms of IP rights issues, I want to start from the beginning. Um, when you're creating an NFT and buy an NFT, what are you really selling and what are you really buying? Um, maybe Stuart and Tanya, you can speak to that a little bit. Um, sure. So um, thanks, Joyce. It's great to be here, everybody. Um, so let's take it in order for in the creation of the NFT and then talk about the rights that you're getting in the NFT. So what's interesting about NFTs is that it's a technology that is bringing together um, a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different players. And you can look at it through a lot of different axes. So you've got everybody using the same technology, ranging from digital artists and two guys in a garage band to iconic property rights holders, uh, well-known musical artists, um, entertainment, everybody using the same technology. Um, so that's one axis to look at it. The other axis is you've got existing works that people are now looking to create NFTs out of as well as new works that are being created just for purposes of NFTs. So all of those things are coming together. The rights that you need to create an NFT is not so clear. And for if, you're a, if you're a rights holder where you hold all the rights, so there are bundles of rights that you can hold if you're looking at it from an intellectual property law perspective. But if you've created your own work, you hold all the rights, no one can tell you that you can't create an NFT of your work. However, in a lot of agreements and a lot of relationships, especially in the music industry, um, the entertainment industry, those rights have been allocated amongst the different, a number of different parties. Um, the rights to promote something, the right to create merchandise from something. And so it requires looking at agreements that, in ex that are in existence that did not contemplate NFTs whatsoever, probably don't even have something in the agreement that is a, that's similar to an NFT, and now sort of going in and trying to um, decipher who has the rights to create the NFT based on what those agreements say. Uh, what we are seeing already is companies very well aware of this new space starting to hardwire NFTs into agreements on a going forward basis. But in terms of existing agreements, it really is, again, not, and if, if you're not the sole rights holder, a little bit of a case by case basis of looking at if you think about someone, uh, you know, movie studio, studio wanting to take uh, an iconic clip and selling an NFT of that video clip, thinking about the rights that they have to be able to do that. So it's a very interesting issue, you know, if you're a lawyer um, in this space, trying to figure out um, for a very uh, new application of a technology in some pretty traditional agreements and pretty traditional rights, how those come together. So that's on sort of the um, IP or NFT creation side. I'll speak for a minute about the rights you get and then, and then turn it over to Tanya. Um, so the rights you get are sort of, are sort of interesting. And you know, Mark Cuban um, spoke about this a little bit you know, earlier in the conference. So owning an NFT is, you know, is owning sort of the collectible. It's owning the bragging rights. It's owning the ability to say that work is mine. It does not, if you look at it from an intellectual property law perspective, give you rights in the underlying work. And that's true not just because it's an NFT, that's generally true. So if you go and buy a painting, you own that physical painting, it doesn't give you rights to now create posters and mugs and t-shirts from that painting unless that right was conveyed to you explicitly. So silence means you don't get rights in the underlying work and, you know, at, at at best, if you'll have it, these um, agreements are silent. But layered even on top of that is most platforms on which you buy NFTs not only say what I just said, but also include various other limitations. You can't commercialize the work. You can't fold it into a video you might be creating. You can't create merchandise from the work. You can't associate the work with hate speech. They add on an extra layer um, that attaches to the NFT. 
And the question is, well, do those platform rights then travel with the NFT? It's on the platform, you've signed up for the platform, you agree to the terms and conditions, but as the work leaves the platform, do those rights, do those limitations on the work travel with it? And we're already seeing some companies out there developing sort of smart contract legal terms that would attach to the NFT, sort of separate it apart a little bit from the NFT, but attached to it, so that those legal rights travel with the NFT. But the key takeaway is you own the NFT, you don't own the intellectual property rights in the underlying work you've purchased. Thank you. Um, so Professor Evans, what happens if someone misuses your artwork? Um, who can do what about it? It's a really important question and it comes up not just in the NFT space, but we've been grappling with this ever since the, you know, the boom of digital technology and the internet. And I think of the late 90s with the Napster and Grokster apps and being able to create a perfect digital copy of something and send it to a thousand of your not so closest friends from the comfort of your home in your fuzzy slippers. Um, and then translate that into a web 3.0 world. And we have the same considerations, but some interesting ownership issues as, as Stuart was walking us through the difference between the token, which is your representation of ownership and ability to exercise ownership and control over an underlying asset. Sometimes it's physical, but sometimes, and we're talking today mostly on the digital side. That leads me to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It's a jargony thing. Uh, most people will refer to it as the DMCA, and it's an amendment to the Copyright Act that gives some safe harbor protections to platforms, online service providers, if they do a certain number of things. One of those uh, things is to respond to a uh, notice and takedown request if someone thinks that their work is being infringed. And even taking a step back, what are the bundle of rights that Stuart mentioned earlier in copyright specifically? That's the right to copy. The right to prepare, as we say, a derivative work, something adapted from an original. If you have someone who writes a book and then sells the rights to the book to create a TV show or a film, those uh, film rights derive from the original and then publicly display if it's capable of being displayed. Obviously, we're talking in the, in the NFT space or publicly perform. That bundle is the bundle of copyright. So if someone is uh, reproducing or displaying publicly without your permission, you have some options. One of the things I hear is I'm just going to go, you know, community is strong in the space. I'll go on Twitter and, and put them on blast. That's lovely, but that's not going to advance your cause. It may get the community to turn, but you should really be communicating with the platform to say, hey, that's my work and go through the process of a notice and takedown. The platform in order to protect itself from some type of secondary liability for mm -hmm. copyright infringement would take it down. The other side of that though, is that you have to have a good faith belief of infringement because it is a double-edged sword as well. Users can say, actually, I, I am using this based on fair use and they too can make an argument uh, within the terms of notice and takedown. So it works both ways. Final point about uh, not necessarily the DMCA, but aligned is the CASE Act of 2019 that was passed at the end of 20, or enacted at the end of 2020. And by the end of 2021 or 2022, there'll be what's called a small claims enforcement board or a copyright claims board. And so it's easier to protect rights on both sides, both for uh, creators here in the United States and also for, um, for users as well so that we have the adequate balance of protection when it's appropriate, but fair use when it's appropriate as well. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Professor Evans. Um, so we've talked a lot about platforms. Let's talk about things outside of platforms because we're here and interested in uh, decentralizing all the things. Um, Marta, can you speak to how NFTs can be stored? And I'm not referring to the NFT because obviously that's just a smart contract in the blockchain. But what about all that data that actually um, makes up the art um, and, the, and the NFT itself? Like, where do you put that? What is IPFS? Can you explain that and tell us what the options are right now? Sure, absolutely. So uh, right now, uh, a lot of people uh, are saying, uh, if it's not on IPFS, it's not your NFT. Um, and, and what they mean by that is, you know, when you're storing that data on the traditional web, 
um, it, it, it's really not yours. It can just disappear. Um, you know, the way that the traditional web works is it's like you want to tell someone about this really good book that you just read and you say, so you have to go to the New York Public Library. It's the third floor, third shelf from the left, four books over. And so you fly there and you get there and that book may or may not still be there, right? Like the librarian could have taken it away or someone's checked it out or someone ripped a page out, right? And that's how the traditional web works. You know, you're going to, when you go to a web page, it's being retrieved from a particular server somewhere in the world. Um, and IPFS uh, is, is like saying to your friend instead, oh, I just read this really good book. It's called Gone with the Wind. And they can just look up Gone with the Wind and, 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 read, and read the book. Um, and so um, the idea with IPFS is that it, st it stores things, it uses this thing called content addressing. So you address the content directly using um, a, a hash of that particular content. So instead of referencing a location, you reference the thing itself. Um, and so that can be stored all over um, and you will just retrieve it from whatever the closest thing to you is. Um, you know, if that's on your computer already, if that's on someone's device right next to you, you know, you don't have to have things pinging across the world. Um, and so the idea here is, you know, there are all these new uh, projects that are doing NFTs and that's great, um, but many of them may or may not be around in a few years. And, and if that's the case, um, you know, you really want to make sure that this thing that you paid all this money for, that you still have that thing. And so the best way to do that, um, in, in my biased opinion, um, but also I think in a lot of, um, of people's unbiased opinions is to store it on IPFS. And Stuart, you know, when you're advising your clients um, and say you have a very famous artist or a company with a lot of IP um, assets, um, and it's really important for them to get it right, what do you tell them in terms of the considerations on choosing how to store? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And Marta makes a great point that relying on a platform storing your work, um, you know, leaves a lot of large rights holders, you know, globally well-known rights holders a little bit uneasy. Um, the, the challenge for them and the interesting question for them is, they still trust themselves more than they might trust um, a third party platform, even something like IPFS. And that's the tension um, that exists there because their feeling is we've been around for decades. We have incredibly secure systems. We're not going anywhere. We have you know, rights and properties sitting on our systems that are as valuable, if not dramatically more valuable um, than even the NFTs. And, and we are, we're confident in our own ability. We trust ourselves. We're confident in our own abilities. And they have a reputation issue. So, you know, their perspective is, even though that means that they're now responsible and from a legal perspective now liable if something happens to it, again, they trust themselves more and they're concerned reputationally what would happen if a, a platform they don't control were to go away. And again, even if they could say to an NFT owner, hey, it wasn't us, it was that third party platform, we did nothing wrong. They know that's not gonna get them very far because they're concerned about the reputation. So an interesting tension that exists already today, I mean, you know, we're not, we're not that many months into NFTs um, hitting what I'll call the mainstream, which is um, rights holders, traditional rights holders looking at NFTs, is a real debate as to whether they wanna store the works themselves, because again, they trust themselves and their own security and their systems and and feel comfortable with that and you know can sell that internally versus trusting newer platforms or you know even ipfs which is nothing again against the power and security of ipfs but it's it's relatively new compared to a company that's been around for you know 75 years um and that's a real interesting tension point the issue the, the intersection of liability and reputation and and the newness of this which i think is an, an evolving story um, that we're going to see play out over the next couple of years that's great. Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, I want to move on to the topic of royalties because one of the main reasons um, that drives artists um, and even purchasers to the NFT space is the ability to um, share royalties and to also collect royalties from future secondary sales. Um, 
And so can you talk a little bit, um, Tanya, about what legal issues you need to consider? Um, and I think inescapably from that, we want to talk about what are the actual technical tools we have available to make sure that the money gets passed on to the correct people. Yeah, it's really fascinating. The prospect of, of artists being paid automatically through a series of smart contracts is a real game changer in the space and one that is capturing the attention of a lot of uh, creators, and musicians, uh, and other artists who, did, who, don't, who no longer will have to wait for months and to offset reserves or to trust an intermediary or a gatekeeper to pay them um, anything, <laughs> let alone on time uh, or every time there is a sales event. And when I think about uh, my time in full-time practice, mostly on the literary law side, for example, my client shouldn't have to come to me on escalation of royalties on the 5,000th and for the 5,000 and first copy of a book, we can um, be informed by an oracle that says when that number hits, say on Amazon, those royalties would automatically boost up and the payments in micropayment fashions would um, proceed. So that's the, the exciting um, part of, of the royalties discussion, but there are some significant limitations in the space as well. Um, once you get to the resale rights, and, and I also distinguish that initial sale and the revenue generated from that initial sale from royalties, um, any payments that would come in from the resale or the secondary market as well. So some platforms support royalty payments and secondary or resale rights within the confines of their particular platform. Far fewer actually allow for what I call the, uh, the portability of whatever that royalty agreement is. And the portability comes from an extension of, and I'm going to get a little uh, wonky or jargony here, but focusing on non-fungible tokens, there's a specific um, uh, set of, of code instructions through, if you're in the Ethereum, uh, Ethereum environment, the ERC-721, and that the, the Coding for an ERC-721 distinguishes it from an ERC-20 where you have fungible tokens where one is interchangeable and therefore the same. In the non-fungible space, each one is unique. There's an additional uh, standard extension known as the EIP-2981 um, that will allow for any coded agreement that, um, that supports resale rights, secondary payments, um, can be portable as long as the other platform also um, acknowledges and accepts or honors, I should say, that extension, the EIP-2981. Mintable, for example, I believe was the first out of the gate in um, acknowledging it. I think of platforms like Rarible that says not yet, but soon. Um, and then there are some that don't currently offer that at all. So you have to compare and contrast between the different platforms um, a separate but related issue is splitting payments when you have collaborators. And that is something that I know that more and more artists are going to demand, uh, but not, not every platform currently supports. That's really interesting, Professor Evans, and I think the next year or two would be really, really interesting in terms of development of the space. Um, I want to spend just one minute here on the securities law issue. So what happens when you're fractionalized in NFT? Um, maybe in a few words, let us know. Should you do it? Is it risky or not? Yes or no? Um, so, so I'll speak to this for just a minute, although with the caveat that I'm not a, a securities lawyer, uh, but have been around this issue enough. So it's not surprising that you know securities law issues pop up given uh, all of the activity around that um, in the crypto space generally. It's not the, the issue of fractionalizing an NFT per se that creates the issue. So I can take an NFT and get a bunch of people together and we all um, put our money together and we, we purchase something and you know go off and, and, and enjoy the work and then maybe resell it. Um, it's a matter of whether and, and sort of how you promote the work that you can create an investment uh, contract out of how the NFT is being promoted and sold. And there is a history um, in, the, you know, in the case law of situations where 
goods that you would never associate uh, as being a security. You know, whiskey is, is a good example of that, but being promoted and marketed in a way that turns it into an investment contract and therefore security. So it's, it's, I think what concerns people, it's not the NFTs per se, it's not even just fractionalizing them itself that creates the issue. It's that it's a space where people do a lot of creative things. It's a space that's moving very fast. Um, and it's a tripwire that you can hit if, if you're not careful um, with how you're promoting the NFT on a going forward basis. Thank you, that's super helpful. Um, so I think we're out of time here. Um, and thank you very much, Stuart, Marta, and Professor Evans for your time. Um, and thanks so much, Ethereal Summit, for having us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Therese. Therese.